praise the Lord. God is good. And all the time, that's a little old school. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Amen. 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 I give all glory and honor to God. Um, I give all glory and honor to our pastors who are not here. Amen. We're praying for them as they are out and about. Amen. Thank you for the pastors that are here. Amen. Thank you for all you all that are here. I know you expect to see Bishop, and I'm, I'm not as cool. I'm not as gangster as Bishop. I don't have my gold chain. I can't throw up gang signs. But it's all right. It is all right. God is good. And all the time. Amen. 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 Give an honor to my wife who's in the back with the little children's. She wanted to be here. No, she didn't. She's like, I heard you preach before. You all right? I'm like, come on, babe. That's messed up. But thank God for her. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be who I am today if not for her. If not for God using her to pull me out of the pit that I was in. Amen. Because I was in a pit. I was in a pit. But he used her to pull me out of that pit. Amen. God loves you. Bishop says this all the time, and sometimes I think we just don't really grasp it. God loves you. God is love. His will is always best. God is all-knowing. His directions are always right, and God is all-powerful. He can enable you and I to do his will. Amen. All right, now I won't be before you long. I know everybody says that, but truly I'm going to speak what the Lord says and then we're going to get out the way. Amen. Our scripture text this morning is going to be from Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 2. And I'm going to read it from the uh, NLT. That's Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 2. Hebrews 12 verse 1 through 2. See, Pastor Tyron, I'm trying to do what you do. You say, Pop, you always do what pops do, so I'm trying to follow suit. All right. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Now, as we look at the scripture text, Paul wants us to realize that one, we are called to be a witness. We are called to be a witness, and that's the first step in our service to the Lord is to be a witness and to live for the Lord in faith. People are watching. They watch what you do. They watch what you say. They watch what you don't do, and they watch what you don't say. They even watch what you post on social media. I know a lot of people who are CIA social media agents. They want to see what you look like. They want to see what posts you like. They want to see what you're posting, what you're commenting on, what you're sharing. They want to see everything. They are watching. They want to see. They, uh, they're watching, they're watching, they're watching. What are they looking for? They're looking to see someone living for God sincerely. Someone who loves God with all their heart, all their soul, and all of their might, who loves their neighbor as themselves. They want to see if it's even possible to do that. And if so, what are the benefits of serving God? They want to know, does God really love them? And if so, what does that look like? They are watching you and they are watching me. So what does God's love look like? How is his love expressed? It's expressed in 
serving. 1 John 4, 8 declares that God is love. And Matthew 20, 28 says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. So since God is love, love's whole reason for stepping into time and putting on flesh was to serve. And if love was expressed through Jesus serving, then it must be the same with us. We must serve. It is our duty. It is what we're called to. Our assignment given from the creator. Now, our theme for this year is improving our serve. The charge we have been given this year is to have 80% of the citizens of KLCM to actively be serving. Now, there's a lot of serving, but the quality of our serve is not at the capacity where it could be. Why is that? What's holding us up? All right, I'm about to give you the title of my message. So I need you to look to your neighbor. Say, neighbor. Don't get offended. I'm just saying what Brother Leonard is saying. You got me? Say, neighbor. You're too heavy. Oh, man, look at your other neighbor. Say, neighbor. You're too heavy. All right, they might get offended around you. So look to yourself, say, self, I'm too heavy. My, my, I'm too heavy. All right, we were all given gifts to serve. Deposits the Holy Spirit made when we accepted him into our hearts. And all gifts are given to help, to serve, to equip each other. 1 Corinthians 12 and 7 says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Some of these gifts include, include we have our apostles, we have our prophets, we have our evangelists, we have our pastors, teachers, we have administrators, we have the gifts of discernment, evangelism, exhortation, the gift of faith, giving, healing, helps, hospitality, knowledge, leadership, mercy, prophecy, serving, speaking in tongues, and wisdom, just to name a few. Now, with these gifts, there are certain characteristics that should be evident as we strive to improve our serve. Galatians 5 and 22. But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions, joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. Now, you might be thinking, Brother Leonard, uh, you just read me the fruits of the spirit. What's that got to do with serving? I'm glad you asked me. I'm going to let you know. We must ask the Lord to examine us to see if we're serving as Jesus intended us to. Do we have joy, not just for ourselves, but does it overflow as we serve? Do we have and walk with a peace that subdues chaos that is all around us? Do we show patience while we're serving? A patience that endures. And do we display kindness while we're serving? Even if they aren't kind to us. Even if they don't speak to us correctly. Even if they might be a little ignorant to us. Rude to us. Do we still show and serve with kindness. Do we serve virtu uh, uh, virtuously with moral excellence? Do we express faith that prevails? Faith that believes that as we're serving one another, we are indeed serving the Father. Do we serve in gentleness? And is there an undeniable strength 
in our spirit. Now, I've worked in customer service management for over 20 years. And as I can tell you, as I stand here today, that serving is hard and it has its challenges. You will serve people that you don't really like, that might not like you, that you might deem undeserving. People that never have a nice thing to say. People who just desire to quarrel and bring division. People who wouldn't hesitate to take a knife and stab you in the back if for their own gain. Serving can be humbling. When serving, you must be intentional and you must be disciplined. You must remember that we are all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. It is easy just to let loose and go off the handle. But we must humble ourselves. And we must submit to the spirit and the teachings from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How you serve matters. Because when people see you and you're supposed to be representing Christ, They might think, man, I don't want to serve a God who acts like that. How you serve matters. The position of your heart matters. The motives behind your serve matters. Your posture matters. We might want to go off the handle because someone's acting a certain type of way, but we must remember you never know what someone is going through. You never know. You don't know what happened just before they came in contact with you. What phone call they received. How their body felt when they woke up that morning. You never know. Our job and our responsibility is to serve. Show them the love of Christ. Because your serve could save their life. It could get them off of the ledge. It could get them to put the pill bottle down, to put the alcohol bottle down, to put the needle down. Just by you showing the love of Christ and your serve could save their life. And then in turn, they could save another who in turn would go forth and save another. You don't know what your one act of kindness and serve could do. The ripple effects 10, 20 years down the line. All right, now let's drive into this text because I don't want to be before you long in Hebrews 12.1. Let's see, let's see what Paul was saying, how we can serve effectively. He was saying that there's five things that are important that we want to bring out. There's five things that are important that we want to bring out. Number one, it takes faith to serve, for we live by faith. Number two, you must get rid of all the extra baggage. He says in NLT, strip it off. Number three, you must get rid of sin. Something you got to do. Number four, you must run with endurance. And then five, you must look to Jesus. So therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, it is a life of faith. We need faith in every aspect of our lives. Everything we believe is based off of our faith in Jesus Christ. Our faith is the first step that leads us to serve. We prove that we have faith by our serve. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 20, it says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it in your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give them any food to eat or clothing to wear. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds. By itself, faith is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith and other people have good works. 
But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good works? I will show you my faith by my good works. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. (laughs) Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Our faith should lead us to helping others, thinking about others, serving others. We need faith to believe that we serve others as we are serving Christ. For serving is a sacrifice. Serving is a sacrifice. We are constantly putting others, others' needs ahead of our own. But we have faith knowing that as I put others first, he will supply. As I pour out, he will in turn pour back in. As I give out, it will be given back to me. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 says, give and it shall be given. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over with no space left for more. For with the standard of measurement you use when you do good to others, it will be measured to you in return. As you pour out and serve, as you do good to others, the Lord will bring a harvest greater than what you sown. He will prove himself faithful. And now the second part of our scripture text brings out, it says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. There are a lot of us serving, but not at the capacity we could be serving. And why is that? Because we are too weighed down. We are carrying so much baggage that we can't move properly. Feels like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. When I when God gave me this message, I could just imagine wearing like a hundred different coats. And that's a lot of coats. So I think I can only squeeze in a portion of those coats. So a lot of them just be sitting on top of me. But just imagine, just weigh down, just how that weight would just bend you over. All that weight. Now, you haven't fallen to the ground. You're holding it. But man, you can't see straight. You can't move straight. You can't walk straight, and you're wondering why you're having so much issues, so many issues trying to serve. I want to serve. I want to serve. I want to help, but I'm so, I'm so way down. I can't even look. I can't even look up. All I can see is the ground, slumped over. But that's how we are sometimes. That's how we walk around sometimes. And we even have a heart to serve, but we're struggling. Struggling, and then you ask, uh, imagine someone asks you just to carry their briefcase. You try to go to pick up that briefcase, and there's nothing in there, but you just trying. I'm serving the Lord. Mm-hmm. I'm serving the Lord. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't even see where they're going. You don't even know where they went. You're supposed to be helping them. They have to come back and hold you up. We are just too weighed down two way down and then we even get to the point as we're serving as we're serving the Lord in the back of our minds we're like Lord I'm tired Lord I don't want to do this no more Lord it's time for me to retire I can't serve no more Lord I can't I didn't served I didn't served I didn't serve because you're carrying all that weight. You're carrying so much. You're so weighed down. Stress, worry, and the cares of this life just have a grip. It has a grip on us, and it just monopolizes everything, monopolizes our time and energy. This bill is due. Oh, yeah, but I ain't got no money for it. My child is acting up. Teacher's calling me, and I just want to. (laughs) 
home. Spouse don't want to listen. My boss don't want to listen. Talking crazy. Want me to go off the handle. Wait. And for some of us, that way is just an unworthy feeling. We don't want to serve because of things we had done in our past. The guilt. I don't want to serve, Lord. I can't serve because you know what I used to do. You know what? You know how I used to roll. You know what I used to do. I can't serve. I can't serve. Look, I'll tell you. I used to smoke weed. Herbal essence, Mary J. Every day, all day, if, the, if there was a Y at the end of the week, Marcus would tell Marcus, no. Every day, all day, even on Sundays, after church. See, I'm a PK, so my parents were pastors. So I, even after church, you find me at the gas station. What do I need? Oh, I got to get me some Dutchess, some Phillies. You know what I'm saying? Black and Miles, the cherry flavor. That's the best one. I don't care. That's where I was at. Crack it open. Bust it open. Some of y'all know. Some of y'all might not know, but that's okay. Bust that thing open. Take the cans of paper out. Leave it in. It don't matter. I don't care. Break the herbal up. Roll it up. Boom. Have me a good old time. All day. Every day. All day, every day. I was at like a 24-hour high. There was never a time when my eyes wasn't low. It was so normal, people didn't even know because that's how I was all the time. And you couldn't tell because I was still functional. But just all the way low. Eyes all the way low. Any Anytime moment I got something in my pocket, it could be a whole bunch of J's rolled up. I'm like, man, I tried to be like Snoop Dogg running around here. Now, but how is somebody like that going to stand up in front of God's people and come on, sir. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. I'm not worthy, Lord. I, I, you want me to do what? You know where I used to be. You know what I used to do. Some of us have passed like that. Lord, I don't want to stand in front of people and try to do anything because I know where I was. But that's the very thing, that's the very thing that God wants you to use and wants to push you. Because there are people that need to hear your story. There are people that need to hear your testimony where you were and how God pulled you up and how God has set you on the right path. But you know, for some people, maybe it's just unforgiveness. You got unforgiveness in your heart. Wait. Wait. And the one you're called to serve is the one that you haven't forgiven. So now everything you do, you do it grudgingly. And you do it with bitterness. And you got hate in your heart. And you got anger built up in your heart. And then for some of us, that way just might be a prejudice. I, psh, I ain't serving no woman. Shoot, I'm a man. Or oh, I ain't serving no man. It's 2023. I'm an independent woman. It's out there. It's out there. It might not be with you, but it is with somebody. I mean, you think about when you read the Bible and you read the Jews, they ain't like nobody. They were prejudiced. They ain't like nobody. You can't serve our God. He came to the Jews. But God came for the world. He came to save everybody. He came for the world, not just for you and your family, but for the world. And he's calling us to serve the world. These are all just weights that are weighing us down. You're serving, but you're way down. You're moving, but you're way down. And God wants you to be free. He wants the weight lifted. You don't need to carry it. He's right there waiting for you to put your complete in absolute trust in him 
and lay it at his feet. He's waiting for you to take a step back and realize you didn't get anywhere on your own. He was right there. He is right there. And he will be right there. First Peter 5 and 7 says, casting all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns once and for all on him for he cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. Psalms 55 and 22 says, cast your burdens on the Lord, release it, and he will sustain and uphold you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Philippians 4 and 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Matthew 6, 25 through 32 says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothes? Look at the birds. They don't plant a harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies in the field and how they grow. Don't they? They don't work. They don't make their own clothes. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith. God cares for you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Lay it down at his feet. He's waiting for you to lay it down. Paul says in Hebrews 12 to strip it off. Your worries, strip it off. Your burdens, strip it off. The cares of life, strip it off. Your frustrations, strip it off. Your, inadequacy, your inadequacies, strip it off. Your hurt and pain, strip it off. Your old mindset, strip it off. Your hatred, strip it off. Your unforgiveness, strip it off. Your bitterness, strip it off. Your pride, strip it off. Your jealousy, strip it off. Your envy, strip it off. Everything that is not like God, strip it off. Strip it off. And Paul goes on to say, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Easily trips us up. We know it. We see it coming. And we trip up anyway. God hates sin. And in turn, we should hate sin. But the truth, but truth be told, there are sinful things that we like and we still cater to. Now we want and desire freedom and to be delivered, but we don't do what we need to do in order to be free. We just allow it to trip us up. We just allow it to fall. Lord God, I, I, oh, I'm going to repent later. We say this before we sin. Lord God, I'm going to repent later, I promise. Maybe it's just me. I, Lord, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't have another bite of that mac and cheese. My body's telling me I'm full. Greed is a sin. My body's telling me I'm full, but man, the way you should make that thing, I just got to have another. And then there's cheesecake after that, Lord. I know we don't talk about food, greedy and and just gluttonous being a symbol. Oh, no, nah, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. We all jacked it up. I ain't get this way, you know, by eating salad. 
You know what I'm saying? I like me a good old uh, cheesesteak. Hello, somebody. We ain't got um, Jerry Subs out here, but Jerry Subs got a fat daddy. It's like double meat, double cheese, double bacon, double everything. Shaba, come on now. Y'all know we got cooks in here. We like to eat. It's all good. But we take another bite, even though our body and our spirit telling us don't take another bite. You don't need it. Don't go there. You shouldn't go there. You know what's going to happen if you go there. You know what's going to happen if you answer that text message. You know what's going to happen if you answer that phone call. We just trip. Sometimes we trip ourselves. Mm. Sometimes we trip ourselves. But we must remember that sin always has consequences. Always. Galatians 5, 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before. That anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says, don't you realize that those who do wrong won't inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin and who worship idols and commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right by God by calling on the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 6. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? God forbid. God forbid. Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Paul understood this. He said this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul understood that he could continue to save people and to serve people and to preach and to teach and to lead people to Christ. But if he didn't put his flesh under subjection, he would lose out. There are many people working and serving today. Serving the Lord, moving and grooving, who God has fired. There are many people working and serving who God has fired. Can you imagine at your job someone who got fired and them coming in there clocking, trying to clock in? And they say, you know, the clocking didn't work. I'll just tell the manager later. And they sit down and start working. And you looking at them like they're crazy. We got some crazy folks out there who think they're going to get a paycheck in two weeks, but they've been fired. They've been fired. The eternal life that they think they're going to receive, it is not for them. Matthew seven twenty one. 
Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I served. I cast out demons in your name. Oh, I was serving. I'm serving the Lord. I performed many miracles in your name. Lord God, I served you hard. With enthusiasm. Y'all know casting out demons ain't an easy job. Y'all know praying, all that stuff's not easy. Preaching and teaching is not easy. Oh, Lord, I served. I sweat and I bled. But the Lord said, I will reply, I never knew you. Ooh. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. My, my, my. So we got to strip off everything that just easily trips us up. It's not worth losing eternity. It's not worth losing eternity. You know where that road's going to end. It's not worth losing eternity. Now, after Paul has told us that we need to live by faith, and when you strip off every weight, and especially the sin that uh, trips us up, he has charged us to run and to live with endurance. And to endure means to Remain firm under suffering and misfortune without yielding. I don't know why Paul always using these words, talking about suffering and stuff. Lord Jesus, why? I'm sorry if anybody told you when you came to Christ that you wouldn't have to suffer. But we suffer because he suffered. We partake in his suffering. There will be times... When your serve will be put to the test, where you might just want to give up and throw in the towel. But Paul encouraged us to endure, stay consistent, continue to serve without yielding, continue to be faithful. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't stop serving. We are called to endure hardness as a good soldier. Hebrews 10, 35, 36 says, so don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then uh, you will receive all that he has promised. We are to do what God has called us to do. Bishop says it, save people, serve people. We're supposed to serve people. We're called to help people. We're called to do good deeds to one another. We are called to serve the church. We are called to serve our communities. We are called to serve our families. He has called us to serve. And Paul instructs us to run with endurance. But man, we are so weighed down that we can barely move. Now, it's important that we don't try to do all this without the Holy Ghost. It's impossible. You can try it. You won't get very far. And that's not what God wants anyway. This thing is a partnership. He sent the Holy Ghost to empower us to serve. Let's listen to Paul's final instructions. So therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on 
Jesus. Because he is the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. We must keep our eyes on Jesus. We must keep our eyes on Jesus. We must keep our eyes on Jesus. Just one more time. We must keep our eyes set before us on the creator of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ. For we serve an audience of one. We are to live our lives to please him. I'm sorry I like you, but I can't live to please you. We're, brand, we're friends, we're boys, but I can't live to please you. I have to live pleasing to the one who created me. The one who knows every hair on my head. And trust me, that got to be hard because, you know, I ain't got too much up there. My God. But the one who knew me in my mother's womb, we have to live pleasing to him. We serve for an audience of one. And he never intended us to do this without him. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. That's why when we accepted him in our hearts, he planted the spiritual gifts inside of us. Isaiah 26 and 3 says, you keep him in perfect peace. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Psalms 121, 1 through 2 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalms 146, 5 through 8 says, but joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord, their God who has made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in him, who keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. And Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 says, Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of heaven and earth. He never grows weak and he never grows weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. And he gives power to the weak and he gives strength to the powerless. Even youth will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. We must look to Jesus for help. We must look to him for strength. We must look to him for peace. We must look to him for joy. We must look to him for safety. We can't serve how he desires us to serve Without him. We need him. We need him. We are called to improve our serve this year. We must walk in faith. We must strip off every weight and the sin that so easily trips us up. We must serve with endurance, not giving up on yielding or yielding when things get rough. And finally, we must look to Jesus, the creator of heaven and earth. But in order to be effective, we have to get this weight off. We are too heavy. Too many things are weighing us down. Too many things are keeping us from serving at our best. Now, what we dove into today is not a complete list of the things, the weights that are, that are on us. There are, many, there are many things that we wouldn't have enough time to even cover them all. There might even be something in your mind right now that might be holding you down that you know is a weight that you need lifting. 
And if not, I ask the Holy Spirit to tell you right now, Lord God, what is holding me down? What is slowing me down? Just close your eyes for a moment and just think about that. What is holding me down? I ask the Holy Spirit, what is holding, what is holding me down? What is holding me back? What is keeping me confined? What is keeping me imprisoned? Why am I still in bitterness and unforgiveness? Why do I still have shame and guilt? What's holding me back, Lord God? Now, you can't get it all off. But Lord God, we're asking you to just strip off just even one of those things today. Even just one of those things today. Reveal it to your people, Lord God. Reveal it to them. Speak to their hearts, God. What do they need to lay down this morning? What do they need to lay down this morning? Really think about it. What do I need to lay down so I can serve you, Lord? So I can serve my family better. So I can serve my friends better. So I can serve the church better. So I can serve the community better. What is holding me down? What is keeping me? What is stopping me? 